second speaker, and I'm just trying to uh, navigate the bio here so I can properly introduce him. Here he is. Okay, so we have Brian Dodwell, Director of, of Practitioner Education, Combat Terrorism Center at West Point, the United States Military Academy. If you haven't been up there, please get up there. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. I'll be up there again for the Army-Navy game, which is an annual for me. Uh, <coughs> Brian Dodwell is the Director of Practitioner Education at the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, an instructor in the Department of Social Sciences, U.S. Military Academy, West Point. In his capacity, he conducts research on various terrorism-related topics and manages practitioner education programs. His research interests include jihadist terrorism in the United States, U.S. Homeland Security challenges, and transnational criminal organizations. Mr. Dodwell regularly lectures to intelligence and law enforcement community audiences on these and other related topics. At West Point, he teaches two cadet classes, champion at West Point, nice job, all right, uh, and uh, terrorism and counterterrorism in homeland security and uh, defense. Prior to joining the combat terrorism, combating terrorism center, Mr. Dodwell was the Operations Branch Chief at the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, DHS, National Exercise Division, which manages the Interagency National Exercise Program and assesses interagency counterterrorism strategy and ecology at the senior levels across the U.S. government. Mr. Dodwell directed the first ever national exercise to focus on intelligent and counterterrorism investigative capabilities and policies. In addition, he co-developed and managed DHS's Terrorism Prevention Exercise Program, the lead entity for exercising the capabilities of state and local fusion centers. He has also served as a counter-proliferation analyst supporting the Defense Threat Reductions Agency. Mr. Dodwell holds an MA in Security Studies from Georgetown University, Security Studies Program, and a BA in Political Science from Wake Forest University. It gives us great pleasure today to welcome Brian to the InfraGuard Program here in New York City. Please welcome Brian Dodwell.
from that. I'm not going to talk specifically about that today, but if anybody's interested, come grab me afterwards. Be happy to, to talk a little bit about what we've seen here. Although a lot of those findings were reported widely in the press um, at the beginning of, of May. Um, so again, it's a little bit about who we are, um, and uh, again, happy to talk to me afterwards about things that, that aren't covered specifically here today. So what I am here to talk about today is, as you see on the gigantic movie screen behind me. Um, I feel very intimidated sitting behind this thing at this stage. I feel like I should be doing a dance number out here, but I won't, I promise. Um, nobody wants to see that. Um, so, American Domestic Jihadi Advocacy. And, and really, the point of this presentation is to take a slightly different take on a topic that's covered a lot. Um, our previous speaker did a pretty good job of, of rolling through some of the significant plots that we've seen over the last 10 years. Um, what I want to talk about is, is the broader context um, that these plots are situated in. It's to talk about individuals and groups um, that are situated within the United States um, that, that talk about these issues, that advocate um, for, for uh, issues of concern, jihadism, um, violence, some overseas, some talk expressly about it here in the United States. Um, but the point is, is that there's a broader community here um, that, that we should take a look at and understand because these things don't happen in a vacuum. These, these plots do not happen in a vacuum. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. But first, I always like to throw up uh, this picture. So, anybody see the jihadi in this group? Any guesses? You can shout them out. Who is he? First to the left. First to the left, yeah. A little sketchy looking guy. I like the guy on the top left. He's got that wispy teenager mustache, like he's trying to act cooler than he really is. Um, but, but anyway, what's, what's the point of showing a picture like this? Because there is, there is somebody in here who's a person of concern we'll talk about later who's not currently sitting in prison. Could be anyone. Could be anyone. They all look alike. They're all Caucasian kids from Northern Virginia, right? And so the, the point is, is that when we talk about uh, jihadism in the United States, there's no profile. There's no ethnic uh, profile. There's no age, educational background, socioeconomic background. There's no profile to what an American participant in jihad is. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, just to flash up some statistics, there's a, you know, Dozens of studies at this point that have tried to break down uh, acts of terrorism or, or attempts at jihadist-based terrorism in the United States in the last 10 years. There's a thousand different ways you can cut the numbers. The use of the numbers that, that we track, I don't claim that they're perfect. Um, people have tracked anything from, from indictments to, to convictions to groups to individuals. There's a number of different ways that you can look at these numbers, but I think the general trends are fairly consistent no matter how you, you really look at them. And that is that over the, the and, and I'll only talk about this in the first presentation. He had a similar graphic up there. And you see in the early to mid part of the decade, there was a you know, slight up and down, um, but, but not a, a particular spike in activity after 9-11. But we've seen, particularly in the last couple of years, since 9 since uh, 2009 and on, um, that we have seen a bit of a spike, at least in terms of events that have been reported, events that have been discovered. Of course, what we don't know is, is what this says about things that may have happened earlier. And of course, if somebody was arrested in 2009, it's not to say that they initiated their, their interest in this activity much earlier. Um, but the, the point is, is that these numbers are there, they stare us in the face, so they force us to ask questions about um, what, what this is all about. How do we make sense of, of this activity? Um, again, it's important to point out that when we look at the overall numbers here, we're still talking very small. I mean, this is mostly single digits for most of the decade, with a slight spike at the end of the decade. This is not a lot of activity. You're going to have some speakers, I believe, later today who are going to talk about right-wing organizations, and they're going to have much more impressive numbers, because that's a far more pervasive concern and threat within this country. When we talk about jihadist-based activity, it's small. It's a small number of people, but as I'll say, probably seven more times over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, uh, terrorism is not a numbers game. Um, all it takes is, is one to have a, a significant impact. So but it's important to be cognizant of the numbers so we can actively calibrate our responses to, to the threat that we face. And in terms of who we're looking at, this is just a smattering of some of the faces that we've seen pop up in jihadist-based activity in the United States in the last 10 years. Um, as you can see, it makes this picture makes the same point as the, the basketball team that I showed earlier, in that there really is no profile of, of the American jihad. I mean, you've got African Americans, Caucasians, Arab Americans, South Asians, um, and of course your your token 1980s female professional wrestler up there, our, our good friend uh, Colleen Rose or uh, Jean Hot James, as she's more popular than them. Um, so we have female representation as well. Um, again, 
again, the point here is that there's a, a wide array of different actors that, that we're facing. So how do we interpret this? How do we make sense of, of what we're seeing um, in this, in this uh, area, in this particular uh, type of, of threat that we see? Um, when we think of the threat from Al-Qaeda and more broadly from global jihadism, when we think of it in exactly those terms, and in most cases global, right? We're, we're talking about international organization, people moving around the world. We tend to think of it uh, in, in these terms. Even when we're looking at domestic cases, we often, when something's reported, we want to talk about uh, you know, what the overseas elements of it were, was it planned from overseas, did people get overseas training, did they get funding from overseas? We talk a lot about these, these international connections. Um, but what about those cases where, where none of these things occur? Because there, there are a, a number of events that occur where almost exclusively the activity is taking place within the United States. So how do we make sense of that? And the title of this, this presentation, this, uh, this seminar today is Domestic Terrorism. Um, in terms of official definitions, the U.S. government uh, defines domestic terrorists as people who commit crimes within the homeland and draw inspiration from U.S.-based extremist ideologies and movements. And so deliberately, the, the government has, has decided that the al-Qaeda-based threat, the jihadist-based threat, is, it falls under the international category because it's seen as an international-based extremist ideology, not a U.S.-based extremist ideology. Um, there are important and justifiable reasons for why these distinctions are made and for why we, we separate these two things, both in terms of organizational and bureaucratic reasons, um, but also it kind of doesn't make sense, right? The ideology is international in nature. Uh, However, when you look at it outside of some of these more formal definitions, I do think it's important to have a discussion about how international, international terrorism really is. Um, because in some cases, it's not very international at all. Um, so again, we emphasize the international ideology that is at the root of jihadist activity, um, and that is certainly correct. It is an internationally uh, based and driven ideology. But it's also important to, to recognize the existence um, of a, a truly domestic element of, of the jihadist based threat here in the United States. Many Americans have traveled overseas to participate in jihad or to acquire training or to join various organizations, but many have not. Many stay here in the United States. Um, and while American jihadists really draw their inspiration from this international ideology, there is also a distinct community within the U.S., a distinct group of, of individuals and groups, um, as small as it may be, um, that have been advocates for jihad. Um, and this has been going on for, for decades, going back to the 80s at least. So this community has a is, are jihadists in nature, but they have a distinctly American character. Um, and that's sort of what I want to talk about today, is to, to look at this, this broader context for some of the plots that we see reported in the press. Uh, so you see in this, this table here, if we break down the numbers, and we look at the, the numbers of events that we've seen over the last 10 years, we can see that when we're looking at cells originating external to the U U.S., we're looking at, at only five um, that have actually occurred. Individuals from the U.S. who trained were from the U.S., uh, went overseas to receive training and came back to the U.S. to conduct attacks. We're talking only 12 or so in the last, last. Again, these numbers are debatable, but they're more or less close enough. Um, in terms of individuals who were, were from the United States, radicalized here in the United States, and went overseas to participate in, in militant activity, we're getting up to more significant numbers. We get to 20. But the largest category is the domestic jihad group. And the way we, the way we differentiate these categories is, is those who we put in this category right here are individuals who are from the United States, whether they're U.S. citizens or, or legal residents or even illegal residents, um, who are primarily situated here in the United States, got interested in this activity here in the United States, radicalized here in the United States, and stayed here in the United States to conduct whatever planning, plotting, or fundraising that they intended to do. So the international connections are much less stark when we look at this particular group, and this is the most populous group of, of the events that we've seen over the last 10 years. So, as you see on the slide here, how is this possible? Um, what is the foundation for jihadist activity in the United States? Where is this coming from? And sort of how is it evolving over time? So, as I think we're all pretty familiar, uh, history did not start on 9-11. Uh, on uh, this, this threat has been around for, for a long time. Um, and when we look at, at the different actors that, that we look at, a lot of it you have to go back to the origins of, of the movement. So, if we want to go back to the anti-Soviet jihad um, is really sort of the key inflection point here. Um, Anti-Soviet jihad obviously took place in the 1980s in, in response to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, and there was a rush of, of individuals, funds, resources 
um, to the Pakistan Afghanistan uh, region to, to fight against the, the Soviet invaders and ultimately push them out. And of course, I think everybody here is familiar with the story, the evolution, the history of Al Qaeda, how it grew out of, out of this movement. Um, but it has relevance here in the United States. So Abdul Azam, because it's a Palestinian, who was really sort of at the vanguard of putting together this, this international effort to, to raise funds and resources and manpower to support the fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Uh, he set up an organization called the Maktab al Kimma, which was essentially the Services Bureau, and this was the entity through which all these resources were funneled into the Pakistan, ultimately into the Afghanistan, to fight against the Soviets. The Maktab al Kimma had, had resources around the world, had offices around the world, um, and uh, had significant presence here in the United States. Um, initially out of the Al-Kifa Refugee Center, uh, which is situated with al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn, right here in New York City. Uh, all ultimately expanded to over 30 offices or entities around the United States uh, that, that helped to facilitate and move money for the MAK to push funds towards for the anti-Soviet jihad. And of course at this time, this was an activity that was supported by our government, as, as we all know, um, given the focus against fighting the Soviets. Um, but it's interesting to take a look back at this history and to see that the infrastructure that was initially developed in support of this effort um, in some cases remains today, certainly not in the way that it did back then, but the remnants of it remain individuals who are knowledgeable of it or informed about it or the remnants of, of this infrastructure evolved over time to some of the things that we've seen uh, more recently. Um, according to some efforts at the low end, probably at least 100 Americans took up the call from Azam to come over uh, to, to the Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, AOR to, to fight against the Soviets or to support the, the fight against the Soviets. So, Again, at least 100 Americans who took this up, individual, independent Americans, um, took this on as, as a cause that they saw as was worth fighting for. Um, and some of these individuals uh, become integral players as we see the development and evolution of global jihadism, and even more specifically when we look at uh, Al-Qaeda itself. Uh, one individual uh, was actually the secretary uh, who took notes during the, the, the formation or the, the foundation movement, or meeting, I should say, um, that they founded Al-Qaeda. So we see an interesting uh, presence of Americans throughout the evolution of Al-Qaeda from its, its origins, from its foundation in 88, um, up until today, which we'll, we'll see as we look a little bit later. Um, the last bullet that I, I wanted to mention here is this idea of classical versus global jihad, um, which I don't want to get too sort of academic -y on you, um, but it's an important distinction to, to make and to talk about. Because when we look at, at what Abdullah Azam was advocating for, um, he was pushing this idea of, of classical jihad, which as he argued was Look at non Muslim infringement of Muslim territory. It demanded the immediate military involvement of all able Muslim men in defense of said territory wherever its location. Uh, whereas somebody like Osama bin Laden, uh, who uh, looked at the, the idea of global jihadism in the mid 1990s, he saw it as a much more expansive effort. Uh, so while Zam advocated guerrilla warfare within defined conflict zones um, against enemies in uniform, primarily uniform, bin Laden called for more indiscriminate mass casualty attacks to affect a more global uh, end state. Um, so it's an interesting dynamic, and we actually see this, this, this dynamic play out over the ensuing decades in terms of what individuals are interested in. Obviously, the, the idea of classical jihad, jihad is much more palatable. Um, it, it's, it can it even make sense to, to certain individuals when you see your people who might be oppressed, um, who might be uh, you know, having a rough go of it, and you want to go assist and help, there's something noble about it. Um, and so you get, as we, we see this, this develop over the decades, in the last 10 years, we see numerous individuals, numerous Americans, Muslim Americans, uh, who've gotten interested in this, this ideology, who've started down the more radical path. Um, but what they're interested in is not attacking entities here in the United States. They're interested in attacking uh, or fighting against people who they see as oppressing Muslims in Muslim land. So they want to go to Afghanistan. They do want to fight against the U.S. military, because obviously a real activity. Um, but that's their initial goal, is they want to fight against the U.S. military because they see what the U.S. military is doing as illegal, as, as wrong, immoral, illegal activity, and that's what, what they want to fight. Oftentimes what happens, however, is when they get to these, these, uh, these locations, we see these individuals turned around, convinced by leadership of organizations such as Al-Qaeda, that they're much more used to the movement in coming back to the United States and trying to execute a plot against the United States. They're told that we have numerous foot soldiers here in Afghanistan, they're a dime a dozen, they're much more workable much more valuable to the cause if you turn around and come back to the United States. So you see people who are interested in classical jihad and are flipped into the global jihad, uh, which is obviously a, a scary prospect to look at. So again, keep this distinction in mind as we look at, at how this, this movement evolves over time. 